Well, that brings me to uh, tonight's special event, and I couldn't tell you how happy I am to have with us Dr. Barry Bergdahl from Columbia University. This is the first of our two lectures this spring in Selected Topics in Architecture. We're merging uh, our Selected Topics in Architecture for spring 2022 with our, our deep dive into Degas through Muscarelli Explorations. But um, Professor Bergdahl is the Meyer Shapiro Professor of Art History in the Department of Art History and Archaeology at Columbia University. He, his, his list of accomplishments in the spectrum of architect, architectural history really are almost more than I can go through, but I want to just give you a few highlights. From 2007 to 2019, he was a curator in the Department of Architecture at the Museum of Modern Art, and from 2007 to 2013, he was Philip Johnson curator, chief curator of architecture and design there at MoMA. He's been a board member of the Society of Architectural Historians. I might also add he was largely responsible for bringing the Frank Lloyd Wright archives from Arizona under that joint stewardship of Columbia University, the Avery Library, and MoMA. He is a member of the Pritzker Architectural Prize Jury and he's a specialist in French and German architecture, uh, especially since 1750. He is knowledgeable in so many aspects of architectural history. I think many of you know I spent an extensive period of time from 2009 to 2017 studying architectural history at the graduate level at Columbia. I think I took 15 courses, uh, but five of them were with Professor Bergdahl. He uh, is an excellent instructor, and I hope you'll all join me in welcoming Dr. Barry Bergdahl to the Muscarelli. Thank you. Oh, my sound just came on. Thank you, David, for the nice introduction, but especially for the invitation to come back to Williamsburg and to be able to see this fantastic exhibition upstairs, which um, I imagine if you're here tonight, you've already seen, but the works are, I think, repay uh, uh, a second visit. Um, I am going to spin off it, and I hope there'll be time at the end to see if you think that this little experiment is successful. We don't usually think about architecture in relationship uh, to the Impressionists, but I want to, of course, I've bathed you in color here. There's not so much color upstairs. We'll come back to this interior. You probably recognize the Saint-Chapelle. You recognize something that's finally happening again in Paris, which is tourists. Um, I do want to talk about vision and the city and color. Now, although perhaps Degas was the least attentive of all of those who exhibited with the Impressionists to depict the massive transformation of the urban scene of Paris as the setting for the history of life, he did frequent, almost obsessively, the building which stood at the heart of the argument I want to talk to you about tonight, the argument in the last third of the 19th century over whether or not architecture might, like painting, explore the effects of flickering color to capture the very nature of modern experience in a city of ever-increasing rapid movement. This was an argument that reached its first crescendo, if you'll excuse the pun, in the lush, polychromatic, multicolored architecture of Charles Garnier's Opera House. We're inside it here, looking out the window, uh, which became the very high point of the transformation of central Paris in Napoleon III's Second Empire, although it was only inaugurated after the empire fell in 1875, when the nature of the Haussmannian city that we associate with that uh, astounding rebuilding of the center of Paris became the subject of vigorous critiques by architects that we're going to speak about tonight. Now, while Impressionists such as, so here's the outside of the opera and the avenue, and I want to talk about the relationship of avenue to monument of monochrome background or, or single or dual color background to explosion of color in a monument um, in a moment. So while Impressionists such as Pizarro here on the screen or Monet, here juxtaposing Pizarro and Monet, uh, both near the opera, but there we'll stick with the opera for the moment. Um, well, both of them found that the uniform grayish white of the limestone typical of Second Empire apartment buildings, such as those that lined the Avenue L'Opera, captured here by Camilo Pizarro, and the interesting boulevards captured 
by Claude Monet were perfect neutral canvases for uh, capturing the changing colors brought by the play of light as it changed over the course of the day and through the seasons. Architects became interested in introducing color in the cityscape also in ways that brought architecture more into an active counterpoint with the accelerated movements of life in the city, with the city as a stage for public life. Now Degas, of course, preferred, let's see where we got to go, the interior of Garnier's opera, the life of the stage once the curtain was drawn, and of course the movements of the young dancers captured in the rehearsal spaces that Garnier had included behind the stage. So we're in the rehearsal spaces at the back of the opera, but you can just see out the window, this is a daytime rehearsal, the types of apartment houses that I'm talking about. And we'll come back to that relationship between monument and um, kind of uniform background. But it is striking how in this 1875 canvas that you see on the left, he leaves a view to the city open, a contrast between the preparations for choreography on stage and a glimpse of the monochromatic background of buildings in which the mortar was drying even as Degas was capturing them in oil in 1874, 1873, 74, 75. So I'm going to take you back a little bit into a bit of a classroom lecture on the problem of color in architecture and bring us back up to the opera and then way beyond. So let's leave the world of painting, but here we're in the world of Baroque architecture where in a certain sense we might say the chapel, this chapel, uh, which I stumbled upon on a trip to Bergamo in the north of Italy some years ago from the middle of the 18th century is an explosion of color. But color was expunged from high architecture, from high architectural thinking with the great revolution of neoclassicism, with the archaeological discoveries, with the discoveries of the, uh, at first hand, the uh, architecture of Greece uh, and the uh, putting forward of Greek and Roman architecture uh, as an architecture of formal purity without the distractions of color, uh, additions, and the like. So that neoclassicism was meant to take one almost to an essence of architecture as truth. And this was especially put forth by these vast publications of, um, of architectural monuments uh, once it became possible for adventuresome people to venture into Ottoman-occupied Greece. Uh, here we have uh, two Englishmen. You see this painting, ironically enough, of a painter here it has, is actually James Stewart uh, recording. He's gotten himself up in Turkish dress that he might pass, as it were, uh, on the Acropolis, um, recording the Eric Theum and the famous Karyatid porch. All of the color is worn by people in the city, but for him, of course, the buildings of classical Greece were pure white marble, expressed for its material beauty, but also the beauty of the form and of the proportions. Uh, and, of course, this lent itself to print. This connects to the print techniques that are upstairs, to print techniques, because, of course, engraving did not have the capacity to work in anything but monochromatic black ink and shades of gray. Uh, we find the same in French publications of the period. And then we begin to find this influencing the most um, outstanding, uh, most monumental buildings of late 18th century Paris. And of course, in a hierarchy of values, it's always the large churches and the palaces that set the stage of what high architecture should be. So for instance, here in the church um, Saint-Sulpice on the left bank in Paris by the architect Servandoni, or even grander, uh, relatively contemporary, uh, Soufflot's today the Pantheon, but built as the Church of Saint Genevieve. I could speak about either of these buildings uh, until you ask me to leave, but the point is that they are embodying this notion that pure architecture was an architecture in which color was almost expunged, with the exception of a little bit of gilding, let's say, uh, in the lettering. Uh, the same true under Napoleon, who begins to try to transform Paris into a neo-imperial Rome to rival Rome. By the time he was doing this, he had also occupied Rome uh, for the, uh, let's say here, for the lower legislature. This is the House of Burgess of France, if you will, the Assembly Nationale, uh, or a building that was started as a monument to his um, uh, army's uh, glories, but was finally finished in the 1840s. So getting into a period where I'm going to begin to show you this white palette of architecture is going to slowly begin to be critiqued. And it's going to be critiqued actually by first returning to the source, 
by returning back to look at Greek monuments. Oh, it's not only a Parisian phenomena. Here's the Palace of Justice uh, in Lyon, the second largest city in Paris. Um, we begin to see something happening in the 1820s. Now, this is, of course, fits into the group I've just shown you. This is part of the enormous building of churches in Paris after the restoration of the monarchy, uh, with its assertion, again, of a allegiance with Catholicism uh, under the restored Bourbons, Louis XVIII and Charles X, between 1815 and 1830. This is the Church of Notre Dame de Lorette. But beginning to, uh, with the notion that this great program of churches should also give employment and expression to the wonders of French painting and sculpture. So when we get in, go inside, we begin to get a appearance or a role for color in the form of painting, but also this extraordinary soffit ceiling uh, inside the church of Notre Dame de Lorette, a uh, court of art gallery of the period. But what's really is going to change is, as I already hinted, a complete reevaluation of everything that now three generations have taken to be the absolute truth about architecture, that the Greeks and the Romans produced the finest architecture. It was made without color. It's, if you spent your time uh, traveling abroad on the grand tour, one of your duties might be to measure up a temple to try to determine to what extent it corresponded to perfect proportions and gave you perfect proportions to bring into modern architecture, that modern architecture might rival the splendors of the unrivalable uh, antiquities of Athens and Rome. In, thi um, in this case, the uh, best preserved Greek temples on the Italian coast were at Pestum, south of Naples. And in 1827, 28, a young French architect who was trained in the system, in fact, he had worked on this building as an assistant, named Henri Labroust, decided that for his fourth year required assignment during his five year period of study, in Rome as the winner of the Grand Prix, he would study these buildings. And he sent back an, an unbelievably inflammatory archeological restoration of these buildings. Now that too should occupy us for several hours. It's a very complex argument, but I just wanna point out two things that he did. It's a little hard for us in 2022 to imagine what could be controversial about showing what a Greek temple looked like when it was whole rather than a ruin. But there are a number of features of this argument that um, Labrousse made that really shook up those who thought these buildings should st serve as a standard point of departure uh, for the future. One was that there are three temples at Pestum, and they get progressively more refined in their proportions. And it had always been said that the most refined one was the latest, because the, these were colonists. They'd come from Greece. It took them a while to get their act together. You know, first they were doing something like the buildings of Williamsburg, but soon they were building Hampton Court kind of thing. But no, he said, these were, the, it's the other way around. He said the one that has the most robust is when these people discovered they weren't colonists, they were from Pestum, and they made their own architecture. So first of all, he says, I don't accept the fact that all architecture has eternal truths for all time. But more radically, he suggested that there were traces of color to be found here. And he also liked the way that the societies might decorate the buildings. Here you see after a, a wartime victory, the temple having been decorated. And at exactly the same time is the great moment of the discovery of Etruscan tombs. Uh, and the young French architects, well, in fact all European architects from the north, are ravishly excited by these incredible discoveries of a kind of lost world of polychromy, as they'll say, multicolored um, Etruscan uh, architecture, multicolored antique architecture in general. Uh, and even if this was a building for the passage of a recently deceased person into the afterlife, for them it showed them that antique life was a life of color, of joy, of dance, uh, and of celebration of life through the application of color and of painting to buildings. And here is Labrouche shortly before he comes back to uh, France, where he's going to get a government job and build important buildings, imagining what the ancient city of Agrigento looked like. Now, this is complete fabrication, but you'll notice that he imagines that the temples, the public buildings, even the little gateway into uh, the upper town of Agrigento had been brightly painted in color. This was something that the academicians back in Paris couldn't accept. It meant for one thing, since this was adding about 
I don't know, a little centimeter or so of stucco and paint that all of the proportions that everybody had spent the last 200 years studying and arguing about were wrong. So this is a, um, not only the fact that architecture should be white and pure, but all the proportional systems were wrong. His brother got in on this. This is Theodore Labrouste uh, imagining the temple. This is the Etruscan um, temple at Cori, which is still very well preserved if you travel south of Rome, but imagining that the temple was almost a stage set for public rituals, uh, painted in bright colors, but decorated with garlands, uh, with shields. Uh, in other words, it was a place of exuberance rather than uh, somberness. The key protagonist in all of this was the German-born but a French, naturalized French citizen, um, Hitorf. You see him here in a beautiful uh, drawing by Ingres. Uh, and although Angela here depicts him only in line, uh, this is a man who made color the subject of his life in architecture. A whole series of expeditions, particularly to uh, Sicily, where he studied both modern and classical architecture, uh, and he began to take advantage of a new printing technology, color lithography. And color lithography not only allowed him to make beautifully colored books on architecture. This is a book that's about this big, like all the books that I'm showing you. Not, not quite as big as on the screen, but bigger than on my screen. Uh, and so this really spreads this out as models that could be used. It upsets the archaeological truths of several generations. Uh, and he's going to quickly make this argument, not only we need to rethink the historic sources, but we also need to think about our cities that are changing, that are being built uh, in, uh, increasingly in post-Napoleonic times in greater speed and with greater density. Among the ruins of the buildings I visited, he writes, he's talking about Salinunte in Sicily, as in all of those of the city, there are numerous fragments of sculpture and architecture with colored stucco. The traces of this system, so he doesn't think this is just arbitrary, he thinks there's a system of color, that's every bit as important as a system of proportion or a system of construction. The traces of this system leave no doubt as to the practices adopted by the ancients of coloring their sculpture and architecture, enlivening with color and painted ornament not only the insides of their temple, but also the external walls of the cella, the columns, the architraves, the metopes, the cornices, the pediments, and even the tiles. He went on then later to explain some more of his color lithographs. Uh, my main aim has been by bringing together the facts and supporting evidence to show that architectural polychromy was invariably used by the Greeks and that it was accepted in all their buildings as the most appropriate means of adding charm and elegance to the majesty of their temples. Qualities of poetry, this he thought was missing from Napoleon's buildings, qualities of poetry that are always associated with the people and their gods. So for him, color brought back life, it brought back society, it brought back the reflection really of an entire culture and a population into the buildings. The Greek white temples, he said, were a dead imagination of the neoclassical misunderstanding. Uh, and he soon, here's his reconstruction of uh, temple at Selenunte as an absolute explosion of color. He believed that bright colors, red and blue, you see here a little bit of green, were to pick out the architectural details, but that the, for instance, the shafts of the column, the background color was a, a kind of light yellow stucco that unified this all into a system. Other architects, I'm showing you here, the Germans, they got excited by his discoveries, but they said it, the base color wasn't yellow, it was red in the case of Zemper and others. So this is a period when people get really excited over what was the system of color in ancient architecture. But Hittorf wasn't going to leave it at that. He became one of the great builders in this transformation of Paris that I keep hinting at, what's going to lead up to the culminating monument of the opera where Garnier and Degas will meet in a kind of coloristic explosion of materials and light. So appropriately, since Hittorf thought that this was very much about bringing life to architecture, he first brought it into buildings that were associated with entertainment. This is the circus. It was a place for obviously showing off horses and various acrobatic acts that was built on the Champs-Élysées, which is the great promenading park that connects the um, Place de la Concorde up to the Arc de Triomphe. Uh, and he built a series of buildings, restaurants. This was a kind of entertainment center, if you want. And all of these buildings were brightly colored. That one no longer exists. But this one, which is in the east of Paris, the Winter Circus, where the circus performed in the winter, you can see immediately taking over this notion of bringing color to neoclassical buildings, even if we don't have any 
building in ancient Athens that looks like this round circus. Now, what is also becomes incredibly important is, of course, my slides uh, a little bit lie on this fact. If you're planning a trip to Paris, don't count on that weather. Uh, Paris is not a city that is frequently with the blue skies that we're enjoying here today in, um, in Williamsburg. So he also thought that this was going to bring something of the advantages of a sunny disposition of buildings that could explode with color even against the kind of grisaille of the Parisian skies. And the place where this reached a culmination and a huge controversy was in the completion of a church that had already been begun at the same time as Notre Dame de Lorette with this great 1820s explosion of new church buildings, but perhaps the grandest of the period, the Church of Saint-Vincent de Paul, which is right near the Gare du Nord. If you're arriving from London on your Paris trip, you could make a stop here. Uh, and this too we could analyze in great uh, length, but what I want to show you is the incorporation of color in both the exterior and the interior of this building. This is earliest drawing for what the interior should look like, but it soon was actually realized like this with, he wanted Angre to do this, but Angre wasn't available, so Angre's, many of his pupils, including Hippolyte Flandrin, did this enormous frieze, kind of evoking the mosaics of Ravenna around the two orders of columns. And most extraordinarily, if you take that, unfortunately, couldn't find a good color slide, but if you look at that open truss ceiling of, the, of this nave, in itself an evocation of the transition from antiquity to the Middle Ages through the early Christian, it's kind of neo-early Christian basilica, but he brings into it a reproduction of the highly colored medieval roof of the Cathedral of Messina in Sicily, which he had drawn. So this being pulled in, but what really um, upset people was not the stylistic eclecticism of the interior. They liked the idea of the absolutely spectacular art gallery of Christian truths inside, but the decision to put color on the exterior that unlike the ancient temples would not need to be discovered by some controversial 22nd century archeologist, but rather would be permanent. He adopted a new technique which was just being introduced of painting on volcanic stone from the Auvergne. It turned out that the prefect of Paris owned the um, volcanic quarry from which this material came, so he was all for it. And then it was baked. So this is a baked enamel volcanic stone, so the color is permanent. It's a kind of architectural ceramics, if you will. And he put the stories of the Bible all behind that. And this was something that was deeply upsetting to the older generation of architects. And it turned out that the painter had really depicted the whole problem of the discovery of the nudity of Adam and Eve. You see it right there to the right of the entrance. And the clergy got all upset. So these were removed after about 15 years. They were rediscovered about 20 years ago in a depot. And they have just been put back into place. So if you go to Paris, you can have that experience of the explosion. Another figure, Dubon, uh, imagining the colorfulness in this imaginary view of a Pompeian atrium, but then going on to design the central school. I think David's going to talk about the influence of the Ecole des Beaux-Arts. This is the Ecole des Beaux-Arts, a painting, sculpture, and architecture school. You see it uh, before 1968, when all of the ancient, uh, medieval fragments and Renaissance fragments were still in place, and then one of my photographs with a depressing police car in the courtyard. But I want to draw your attention in particular to the experimentation with um, what's called lave de Valvic, or lava stone from Valvic in the Auvergne. Is my pointer pointing up there? Yeah. And of famous artists and architects. There's a Jacques-Louis David. Uh, and then into the central courtyard, which becomes a kind of Pompeian explosion of color. And finally, into the amphitheater with this great mural. La Brust, his friend, and the person who had caused such a stir with Pestum also took part in it and recently has been restored to his rather sober Bibliothèque saint Genevieve, one of the great first freestanding public libraries anywhere in Europe. His desire that all of the famous names that were inscribed in the facade would be picked out in red, and this has just been restored. This was not confined to those who, who were partisans that Greece and Rome could continue even with this recalibration or this recolorification, if you will, um, to the classicists. The Gothic Revival architects, led by Villeduc, uh, Lassus, and others, uh, insisted that 
Gothic architecture, too, had been an explosion of color. It was the creation of an incredible phantasmagoria of the mixture of light and color, particularly in this incredible cage of uh, stained glass that allows light to pour into the Saint-Chapelle, which had lost all of its medieval, um, uh, except for some traces, its color. And in a series of about 12 years of work, the Saint-Chapelle, as you see the lower chapel down on the lower right, and then the upper chapel. Uh, the next time you go there, you have to realize that the color that you're looking at is an attempt in the 1840s to get Gothic architecture into this con conjunction. And here, for religious purposes, a kind of ecstasy of color towards uh, Christian faith. And Ville Duc, again, taking advantage of the continued advances in chromolithography, uh, creates records of this so that it become, become a kind of inspiration for others. So this enormous restoration of medieval buildings, secular and sacred, on the right is the 12th century assembly hall in the Chateau at Bois in the, um, in the Loire Valley, restored by Dubon, who recreates all this color. Um, and even in new buildings. So this is a cast iron church, uh, entirely a cast iron interior. Uh, in the 10th arrondissement of Paris by the architect Boileau, all painted up, the metal itself now. He's gone to the modernity of using entirely an iron interior, but it's all colored up. So let's get to our theme of the um, issue of color in the city as it's beginning to move outdoors, as we've seen in some of those. This is, of course, the famous moment, usually when you're hired for a job, especially if you're hired for a job by the Emperor of France, that's Napoleon III on the left, handing not a contract to Haussmann, but a map of all of the new streets he would like to have cut to create a Paris of modern transportation efficiency, uh, both for commerce and for vehicles, for pleasure, of course, but also for sanitation, for security, uh, and many other reasons. There's Haussmann, uh, who is uh, out about to start his work uh, with his um, shovel there, but the transformation, that one-fifth of the, city, the streets of Paris had been built between 1853 and 1870 following this map. I'm going to show you only two streets to show you the principle and the change. Probably most of the very big lines, this is like palm reading as urbanism, the big lines that you can read uh, in this uh, relatively recent aerial view, because you see the explosion of color, the Centre Pompidou. Don't worry, we're not going to bring this lecture right up into the 1970s. But these big, long lines, like this one, this avenue, which I want to show you in a minute, which is one of the longest in Paris, or um, others we'll be picking up again over here, just off the map. This is the Boulevard de Sebastopol, which links the Gare de l'Est, the eastern train station, all the way to the Ile de la Cité, across, and then continues to the, southern, to the Luxembourg Gardens. So that was the first step. So this maps like this, you still get a map like this from Galerie Lafayette when you land at Charles de Gaulle Airport, beginning of the idea that the streets fall into the background and the monuments stand up. They organize the vistas, they're more important, they're of a, more, of a richer architecture. So this aesthetic goes into, of course it's a black and white photograph, you can say I'm cheating, but I wanted you to see it when it was brand new. This is the Boulevard de Sebastopol, and these are the type of background apartments built by many different people, but with consistent lines, consistent use of limestone, and therefore a consistent color palette of being background. Residence, private sector, background. There you see it more recently, some sense of it cutting through Paris. And then, unfortunately, this is a black and white photograph because there's a color explosion in this fountain of Saint-Michel on the Place Saint-Michel as the boulevard uh, makes a slight dog's leg twist uh, as it goes onto the left bank. So this aesthetic, there it is, you know it. This is the building block of the center of Paris, the Haussmannian background apartment house. Nobody stops to photograph them bang on. Nobody takes out a sketchbook to sketch them. They take backstage, as it were, to continue with the opera. This kind of view of very fine stonework, but not meant to be admired and such. Let's go to the opera and then see the effect that Garnier brings. This is our Avenue Le Paha, connects the Louvre to a new building site for the opera there. Uh, it's going to cut through an entire 17th and 18th century neighborhood. Goodbye. Uh, so it's kind of reverse Williamsburg, if you will. Uh, only what is modern will be left standing. Um, and uh, there we have the view looking back from the opera to the Louvre, but we better get it out of uh, 
inexpensive lithography and into color lithography very quickly or into modern color photography. Background apartment buildings, consistent roof lines leading up to now. The opera is an explosion of color, of mosaics, of rich materials. It's not a surprise that some have thought of it as neo-baroque. And it is going to, in a sense, say, this is a place where spectacle is happening. Shouldn't the house of spectacle itself be a spectacle? So this uh, fascinating uh, metaphor, the city is a stage. The opera is on the stage of the city, but once we go inside, we're going to be in the audience and we're going to look at the stage. So this creation of a spectacular architecture. And Garnier writes very interestingly about the building. He wrote an entire book talking about how he wanted to um, make a building that would make it seem like an event, something exciting. So people get dressed up to go to the opera. They, um, it's not like today where people wear their pajamas to go on airplanes. They actually get dressed up to go to the opera to be seen while they're seeing. A uh, terrible 1960s photograph, but as we go in from the outside to the inside, this incredible lavishing of mosaics, new mosaic companies that have been set up in Paris, painters who work to design mosaics, then painters painting the opera. So this is opening night at the opera by two different artists. Chromolithography again to record all of the details, and then this almost symphonic use of color that goes incredibly more gilt and red and richer tones as you moved into the destination promenading spaces like this, the place where you go during the intermissions. Uh, and so this is happening at the same time as the Impressionists are painting the building, having coming up with a new theory of color uh, and um, painting the opera. This has already been ever written about, and I think the in fact already Hittorf used the same color books as the artists of his time. But Garnier, in a very little read essay today, in 1869, as this building is already under construction, he says, I can imagine the day when the wild tones of gold will dot the monuments and buildings of our Paris. I imagine the warm tones and harmonies which will shimmer before our charmed gaze. We will have given up our habit of great straight avenues, beautiful no doubt, but cold and stiff like the etiquette of an aristocratic dowager. Our inflexible street network will have its moment of reaction, and without letting a noose, being a nuisance to anyone, the neighbor can build his house without aligning it to the one next door. The backgrounds of the cornices will gleam with eternal colors. The piers will be enriched with glittering panels and with gilded friezes running along the buildings. Monuments will be clad in marble and enamel work, and mosaics will make everyone appreciate movement and color. It will no longer be false luxury done on the cheap, it will be opulence, it will be sincerity. Eyes will be familiarized with all these marvels of nuance and the effect will demand that our wardrobes be modified and take on color in turn and the entire city will be like a harmonious reflection of silk and of gold. But alas, I look around me, I see gray and somber skies, I see houses newly renovated, I see only the black shadows playing in endless boulevards, I see Paris finally as it is, and from my artist's dream, I plunge back into bourgeois reality. He says, why is it, he said, once I dreamed of a cure for our particular illness that we might call chromophobia, so fear of color. Now, he wasn't the only one in the southern city of Marseille. The architect I wrote my doctoral dissertation on Léon Vaudoyer imagined this incredible polychromatic cathedral where the color comes from the actual stone that is used, different types of green and white stone, marbles and limestone on the exterior, and then as you move into inside, uh, reds and yellows, you have in a certain sense two different schools here. One applying color through decoration, through mosaic, through gilding, and the other trying to come up with color through changing the palette of construction. One that accepts artifice appropriately in the cathedral, uh, excuse me, in the opera, the other that's determined that materials should be honest about what they are appropriately enough in this center of searching truth through spirituality. The rationalists, in a sense, were to win the day, led by Villeduc and his followers. I'll just show you a few buildings as they began to innovate with structural techniques, uh, but also to bring an explosion of color into their buildings through building materials themselves. So the 
we might say that the final third of the 19th century in France has a light motif not only of color but of finding permanent color that won't be washed away by the rain and that can still glitter even after a rainstorm under a gray Parisian sky, although I keep picking sort of touristy photographs to show you this. Um, up on the top is a lithograph by Villeduc proposing a different approach to building Parisian apartment houses, readapting the half timber work of the medieval period but doing it in iron and then filling it in with bricks that have been fired, enameled for color, taken up most spectacularly in one of my favorite buildings of the whole 19th century in France, the chocolate factory at Noisiel outside of Paris. There you see it, it's been recently restored. It belongs to Roundtree Macintosh, so increases the importance of their chocolate in my eyes. And there are some details of it um, and some more. You can see it's built as a extraordinary lightweight building with the explosion of color effects, almost like a kind of great chocolate bar wrapper over the Marne River. It also became, uh, in a very interesting way, the architecture of the Republican governments, the Republican here in the sense of democratic left-leaning, of the city of Paris, it tended to be the case after the fall of the Second Empire, that the government uh, was sometimes quite conservative in its politics and cities were very often much more left-leaning. And this vocabulary of using inexpensive brick but achieving great effects became often associated with municipal pride. So if you walk around Paris and you see buildings like this with exposed brick, diapering, ceramics in various places to bring out highlight of color, probably if it's of this date, it will be either a, um, a high school or some service building of the city of Paris. This is the, uh, perhaps the, uh, the earliest and the most lavish of them, the Collège Chaptal in the 9th arrondissement. You can see some of the effects of color that are being achieved there as the building becomes a polychromatic actor, but not because it's the opera or the justice palace. It's, in fact, the neighborhood high school. Uh, and we get the same. I could show you. There are literally hundreds of these. This one is by the architect de Bordeaux, and this one is in fact by the architect Guimard, but before he becomes the Guimard of Art Nouveau, while he's the Guimard of the rationalist um, school, here building a school building for Catholic school in the south of the 16th arrondissement, in which you can not only read the adventures in structure, the building is held aloft on these um, cast iron columns set in a triangular form, but you can read all of the different materials and they are providing the color. Books come out to make this actually almost into a kind of linga franca, if you will, of the polychromatic city. The great explosion of it and the greatest promotion and the sense that France wanted to make this kind of almost its national mark came with the Universal Exhibition, the World's Fair of 1878. This was an absolute explosion of color and a great promotion of all of the new industries in France that provided enameled bricks, fired ceramics, architectural ceramics, a kind of almost a material catalog of new ways to make buildings simultaneously modern, polychromatic, and joyful, but also ways in which you might buy your building products in France when you went home. Uh, here is the panorama led by a building that has today been wrapped in a monochromatic housing of the 1930s at the far right. Is my pointer show you? Yeah, over here. Um, the Trocadero which was a astounding eclectic exercise uh, mixing uh, Romanesque, Byzantine, and even Arab elements in these kind of twin minarets. Uh, it was one of the most acoustically perfect concert halls uh, ever built in France. Um, the central part is demolished. The wings are now the wrapped uh, trocadero if you go to that part of Paris in the 16th. Uh, but an explosion of color and again painted. So we've gone from actually painting influencing architecture to this colorful architecture becoming a subject for modern painting. Of course, postcards, hand colored uh, or printed through new forms of cheap lithography. Uh, all of these buildings developing an incredible polychromatic explosion, which took on an even higher tonality in the 1889, the next World's Fair, the one that brought us the Eiffel Tower, but also this incredibly colorful palace of the fine arts on the right. Many of these buildings were built of demountable metal frames 
And so we can find elements of these fairs all over the place. So if your travels, for instance, take you on the right to Martinique, you can see this pavilion from 1889, which is now the Schlocker Library uh, in um, Fort de France in um, Martinique. Or if your travels take you to Santiago in Chile and you go to the Natural History Museum, it too is a uh, redispatched uh, polychromatic explosion from the 1889 World's Fair. So we might also just, and then in conclusion, ask what is, the, what is happening as color invades more and more of the city? Partly it's becoming an incredible commercial um, venue. So moving from the opera, which is the National Academy of Music and the Dance, to just behind it, one of the first large-scale department stores to realize that color is going to make shopping a fantastic experience and that uh, you could be of one or two schools. You could say the building should be neutral so that the goods look good, but this one goes on the proposal that these big uh, plate glass windows filled with things that you can buy inside will be even more fetching if the building itself is an extraordinary um, explosion of um, color. And so here we get to, um, interestingly, the work of the architect Paul Sedi, the undersung kind of great prophet of color at the end of the 19th century, the architect of the Printemps uh, department store, which still exists. He had first given a lecture, fascinatingly enough, on use of color in architecture in this room to an enormous audience uh, at the occasion of the 1889 World's Fair. And then he took it into all of his architecture. Printemps still uh, survives with its gilding and some of its um, mosaics and its explosion of color, even uh, as it, some more recent architecture has tried to take it into the pixelated of the digital in the extension. Here's just a panorama of some of uh, Sedi's work. Uh, he says in his thing, I would, um, where do I have it? Architecture acts following the great laws, the great aspects of nature of which it is a direct product. And isn't, he asks, color equally a product of nature? Everything that we see isn't it colored? Can we imagine an object without the coloring that belongs to it? White and black are nothing but intensities of light, so that a monochrome shadow can be considered unnatural and has thus been the exception since the most distant origins of mankind. If I read that to you in an art history class and said, guess the author, you would say Georges Seurat, Paul Signac, but it's Paul Sedi, the architect of this building. Parallelchromy, he says, as it has now been revived, will no longer be reduced only, as in certain past areas, to the superficial coloration which heightens some passages of monumental forms. The new coloration, derived from fired and enamored, enamored, enameled tiles, from mosaics, from marbles, and from stones of various colors, from lava enamel, and from wooden members left visible, will from now on be part of the composition of a building and will endure or perish with it. Our modern polychromy will be the radiance, Sidi announced in that great lecture, of truth. So we just might culminate in noticing that there's a long history then that takes us to one of the uh, most beloved early works by Guimard, sometimes seen as the kind of uh, act of the birth certificate of uh, Art Nouveau in Paris. This is the uh, Castel Béranger uh, in the north of the 16th arrondissement, uh, apartment building. Uh, as you can see, it deliberately shows off the different types of spaces that are inside by different types of windows. It wants to show you what's going on, but it also is an explosion of color through building materials from the cast iron which is, and the copper, which has become green, to the brick, to the finely laid ashlar, uh, to types of rustic stone down here, of course taken up again in the prints that Guimar uh, gives out. And Guimar here in these hand-colored postcards which you could buy to understand his genius of creating le style Guimard, the Guimard style. There he is drawing at his desk. Here he is signing in ceramic, in stone, later on in brick. But this is the most fascinating. This is from the building I'm showing you. Apartment building given a prize in the first competition of facades of the city of Paris. So this won a competition that lasted for about 15 years on what would be the most beautiful apartment house facade. This is absolute heresy. You're not supposed to notice apartment buildings. They're supposed to slip into the background. They're supposed to be the monochromatic kind of, not even the chorus, just forgotten, the kind of stage help, if you will. Uh, but there it is, right over the door, this fantastic doorway, as we go into a world of color, 
of ceramics, a kind of almost a, a secret grotto of greenish uh, ceramics that we move through, parts of it gilt into the staircase, and taken up by a whole series of architects in that explosion of ceramic Art Nouveau uh, in Paris from about 1898 to the First World War. Here's La Virotte, uh, and uh, he really takes it to the extreme. You can stay here. This is the ceramic hotel. Uh, and you continue with the Avenue Rapp. Uh, calmed down by Perret, sometimes seen as the father of modern rationalism, the one-time employer of Le Corbusier uh, in this apartment building, uh, which is entirely clad in panels of ceramic over a reinforced concrete frame. Uh, that make the entire building look as though it has collected the autumn leaves of Paris and brought color into the life of these apartment dwellers. Uh, and finally, just to end, the institution where I used to work, the Museum of Modern Art, if we move to Corbusier, who even for workers' housing thought they can have color, can't afford ceramics, but we will paint them. Here's Corbusier's color scheme, his color piano, the way that you might coordinate colors. Color is absolutely essential to the modern architecture uh, sponsored by Le Corbusier and his followers, uh, first in, in Paris, but then later throughout Europe, and brought to the United States as the international style. Now, of course, the international style was no longer using chromolithography. It was using black and white photography. And from that was born the myth that modern architecture, international style architecture, had no color. But in fact, Corbusier was, in a certain sense, a descendant of the whole line I've tried to show you of the idea of bringing color into the city, not only for the life that it brought, but in an extraordinary dialogue with the new experiments in chromatics uh, that make 19, late 19th and early 20th century um, painting such an explosion of chromatic exploration. So I just wanted to show you that architecture participated in this. I had to find some way to relate architecture to the theme of this very lovely Degas exhibition upstairs. Uh, and thank you for your attention.